Um, but oftentimes you can't do that or it's laborious or it was difficult. So, um, and, and, and it also doesn't use anything about what we found before. So, that, so if you, if you want to use what we found before, which is, by the way, right here, remember, go, go back all the slides when I did this example. We didn't do the new coordinate frame. We were just doing the, finding the T with respect to this guy. We found the T was this. Okay, if we want to use that, what we did before, then, and we want to use that to get to T prime, then the best way to do it is to construct that new N matrix, the six by six matrix. Okay? And by the way, notice how careful I do the units. Um, make sure if it's not zero, you do the correct units. Okay? And we never talked about the units for the N, N matrix, so we get a chance to now. Okay? Remember, so on your cheat sheet, and hopefully you'll write this on the inside of your eyelids and remember this the rest of your life, this is the N matrix. This will come up all the time. Okay? And, and so um, now you need to find these, you know, the, the four different vectors inside this six by six matrix, which is N1, N2, N3, and L. Okay, so let's find N1 first. Okay, and remember, they're all defined with respect to the old coordinate system. So N1 has to point in the new X prime coordinate, and it's got to be defined with respect to this. So it would be 1, 0, 0, and its magnitude better be 1, and it sure is. Okay, so it's defined with respect to this, and that's the new X1. Okay, very good. Okay, now we find N2. So N2 has to point in that direction, but it's got to be defined with respect to this, and it's got to be a magnitude of 1, so you do 0, 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2. Okay, you might have been tempted to call it 0, 1, 1, but then its magnitude wouldn't be 1, right? So you had to do the square root of 2, so it'd make its magnitude 1. It's very important, those are unit vectors, magnitude 1. Okay, all right, N3, with respect to this guy, is again similar, it's 0, negative 1 over square root of 2, positive square, 1 over square root of 2. Okay, so now we found our three uh, unit vectors with respect to this guy, but that point in the direction of the new coordinate system we care about. Okay, now we have to find an L vector that points from the old coordinate system to the new coordinate system. And that will be essentially be 0, okay, remember it's 2 over, 2 down. So 0, 2m, negative 2m. Okay. Now notice unit vectors are unitless. They just they're just directions. They they're not they're not uh, they're not anything. They're just they're just directions, right? So they're they're unitless vectors. So I don't put units on those, but I do put units on this because this is in meters. Okay. Okay. So, um, all right. Okay. So. Now that we have all these four vectors, now we can put them in here and notice they're. Even though I wrote them nice and horizontal, they're transposed, so they're actually three by one. So that when you put them in here, um, they're actually a six by six matrix. And this is really a three by one zero vector. It's zero, zero, zero. Okay? So if you put them all in there, do all your cross products, right? And you should check this at home, do it in MATLAB. You will get a N vector that's this. Okay? And notice I was very careful to do signs. You know, here's all the unit vectors. So those have no signs. Here's all the zero stuff. They don't have any units. Okay, here's all the n vectors. They have no units. Everything in here is L cross n's. And so they have units, if they're not zero, of meters. Okay? And so you'll find that that is the transformation matrix of this system to get from here to here. And if you invert it, okay, and again, you'd never invert this by hand, but plug this into MATLAB, Take the inverse of it and times it by t, this old t you found, and sure, see here it is, inverse of it, times it by t, inverse of this, times it by t, and you will get magically this, which is the same thing we got doing it the other approach. Okay? And it tells you the three rotations and three translations of this point, you know, the three ro the three angular velocity components and the three linear translational velocity components of this guy with respect to these coordinate systems. With respect to that coordinate system. Okay? And go back and check. You'll see, so, so we basically did two different approaches to, to do a transformation. Okay? But it's the latter is the one you'd want to use every time um, if, you, if you're going from one to another. Okay. So... All right, that completes the hardest thing I'll teach you in this entire course. Um, but again, the good news is, is uh, you know, don't drop the class if you don't understand it. Like, first of all, watch the video a million times. Uh, make sure you understand this. But, um, but even if you don't understand, if you can just apply it 
and it, when you do a bunch of practice problems, you'll, you'll see how to apply it, you'll really be fine. I mean, I'd like you to understand where it comes from, the derivation, and I'd like you to understand all the mysteries and, and you know, understand in your mind uh, the differences between rotations and translations and how they relate and everything. But if you don't, you can still easily get by and do fantastic in this course, okay? So um, you, you'll find pretty much both of exams are, are almost exclusively on uh, content that comes later, but it, it's based on this math. So I, I want you to understand it on a deep level to begin with, okay? Okay, so now I want to teach you a, a little uh, concept um, of displacement twists, okay? So, so w when you look up in literature, twists are always velocities, okay? They're, they're uh, angular velocities, and the bottom component is linear translational velocities, okay? And they're instantaneous, so at any instant, as, as some object is moving through space, it's either, it's screwing about some axis in that instant. Uh, and if that axis is, a, is a, pi a pitch of zero, it's a rotation. If it's a pitch of infinity, it's translating along that axis. If it's anything in between, it's screwing about it with some coupled pitch, okay? Um, and, and velocities, and it uses velocities because velocities capture instantaneous, you know, the speed at a snapshot, what, what it's at, okay? Um, you will find in, in, in episode, or in lecture three, that uh, it's more useful to think of these as displacement twists, okay? So a displacement twist basically takes these velocities and turns them into infinitesimal displacement chunks, okay? And the way you do this is you just times your twist by an infinitesimal delta t, some chunk of time, an infinitesimally small frame of time. And you can see it, it multiplies all the omegas by uh, delta t, which you could pull the magnitude of the omegas out times delta t, and how this has the same, and which means you could think of it as, as just uh, the three rotations, three translations, uh, velocities times delta t, which is just infinitesimal displacement. And out comes the top three, uh, just infinitesimal d theta x, d theta y, d theta z, where this is just radians. And then this is d uh, delta d, which is just in meters, delta dx, delta dy, delta dz. So these are, the, the reason no one really uses this, uh, it, it's a little bit of a nonsense thought because it's, it's basically, um, I mean, these are all zero, right? They're infinitesimal increments and they're all, but they're, they're in units of displacements. These are all radians, not radians per second. These are all units of meters, not meters per second. But they're infinitesimally small, they're all zero. But their ratios are not zero. And, and, and that's what is important. And, and you'll see for the next lecture, we need to actually mathematically use displacement twists, even though displacement twists are inherently all zeros, right? That doesn't make any sense. But, but they're, they're not. They're, they're, they're uh, approaching zero, and they're approaching zero in different ways. They're basically the velocities times an infinitesimal chunk of time, OK? And then, by the way, again, if you take the derivative of this with respect to time, then you get uh, Twist, uh, twists that are accelerations, acceleration twists, where this is alpha and that's A, you know, the angular acceleration and linear translational acceleration, okay? And we're going to use all those, okay? So, so, you know, it's nice to think of all the theory as velocities, and that's what everyone does, but if you take the derivative of them, it's, it's accelerations. If you times them by delta T, it's infinitesimal displacement twists, and so we'll be using those. So we, we've covered all the theory of displacements, velocities, and accelerations here packaged in uh, twist land, which, by the way, these vectors are called Plucker vectors. Uh, if, if you want to look them up, uh, the way they're configured, the organization in here is a, is a Plucker vector, and that's how screw theory organizes this information of rotations and translations. Okay, so now we move on to the next topic, which is we've, we've done uh, displacements, trans velocities, and accelerations. Now we want to do forces and moments, so loads, okay? And they're all completely analogous. So um, basically what I want you to do is, again, re-listen to this whole lecture, but supplement um, the forces. Everything I say about, you know, the, the uh, velocities, I want you to supplement with the forces, okay? And you'll see what I mean, the analog, okay? So, you know, I began the, this lecture by talking about the three uh, you know, the, the translation vectors. Well, here, here's force vectors, okay? Force vectors are defined with respect to a coordinate system. They also are a three by one vector. They have three components defined by x, y, and z. It's fx, fy, fz, okay? It's a three by one vector. I put a transpose there. 
Again, all it has is information about its, its direction, the direction it's pointing in, and its magnitude, which is the square root of all the components, or square, square of all the components added, square rooted, okay? And so say we have a potato here, and you've got these four forces acting on it. Um, you might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. It, it really matters where they're pushing. You know, if I push on your head versus push on your legs really hard, you're going to experience something very different, right? And that's because the moments that those forces create are very much dependent on where they push. But if I just give you these force vectors, there's no information about their location. Again, you see the analog. There, there's no information in this vector about where they're pushing on something, the location of it. Uh, just like a rotation, uh, angular velocity vector, there's no information about the axis of rotation. Um, just its magnitude and direction. Okay, and that's why with forces, if I have all these forces, I mean, you can move around anywhere, and it's still the same information. If you add all their x components and set them equal to mass times the acceleration of the center of mass's x component, it's the same equation no matter where you apply them. And same thing if you take all the y components of the force, add them together, equals mass times acceleration in the y direction of the center of mass. Uh, you know, again, it doesn't matter how you move them where, you know, it's going to be the same equation, okay? And, and so, so the location of them is not contained within this vector, but it does matter when, for, when it comes to moments, okay? But when you have pure moments, okay, then they're, again, a three-by-one vector. They're defined by x, y, and z. They have three components. Uh, you know, they're, you know, whereas forces are analogous to rotations, uh, these moments are analogous to translations. Um, okay, they have um, uh, a direction, which in this case we're showing coming out of the plane, okay, but they don't need to be. There's their direction, and their magnitude is this. You know, square all the components, add them, square root them, okay? And again, you can draw them, they don't have any knowledge about their location, okay? And, and if you think about it, if you do bending moment diagrams of beams or in other engineering courses, anytime you have forces and pure moments acting on something, you really don't need to consider where the moment is. They could draw it anywhere on the beam or on the body. And uh, what you do is you, you do have to know where the forces are acting on the beam or the body. Um, and, and you use those to calculate the moments. You take the cross product, you know, the moment arm cross the force, sum them all together, and then you just add in the moments. And it doesn't matter where they're located, okay? And just like translation, there is no... Uh, there is no location that's associated with the moment. Um, it's just the direction and the magnitude. Okay, so, so here's the full analogy. Okay, so uh, just like there are screw lines, there's wrench lines. Okay, and they're, they're, they're orange. They're like the analog to green screws, except instead of velocities, it's loads. Okay, and there's, there's a, you know, they tell you the, the, it's a six by one vector, and the first three just like angular velocity is the force, okay? It tells you the magnitude of the force, how hard it's pushing, okay? And the direction of it is always uh, in the direction of the axis, the, the line of action of the, the wrench, okay? And then you have a location vector that's defined with respect to this guy, x, y, and z components, rx, ry, and rz, that points anywhere along this line. It could just like a C vector, but it's an R vector, just to make it so it's not confusing. But it's the location where it points anywhere along there. And then you've got a Q, which is analogous to pitch. It's basically the, uh, you know, the, the moment over the force ratio. So when you have a wrench, you you're, you're have a coupled uh, force and torque, a uh, coupled force and moment, uh, that as you as you force it, you, you get a moment that's, that's coupled by the, the torque here. So it's in units of, uh, you know, um, well, you know, torque over force. So it's Newton meters over Newtons, which is really just meters, right? And then, and then you times it by force, which is Newtons. And so you can see this times that is going to be uh, a torque, okay? And so the top through your force, the bottom through a torque uh, or moment. Uh, the magnitude of a wrench vector is just the magnitude of the F just like it was of the angular velocity. Uh, you have a n a unit vector that points in that direction, okay? And everything I taught you is the exact same, right? So it, it tells you the, um, uh, you know, the three forces on the body with respect to this guy at this point and the three torques with respect to this guy at this point, um, right? And, uh, 
and and you know the way you decompose it and, and construct it is all the same. You 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 dot product the force and the torque and divide by the dot product of the force and the force to get the moment. You can write the exact same equation and plug these in and this in and find the equations to decompose it. Um, everything's literally the same. And here's here's the analog. Um, when pitch is zero, it's a rotation. When Q is zero, it goes away and it's just a pure force. And the pure force line is a blue line. Okay, remember I, I draw forces as blue lines. They're pure force lines. And they're basically the coupling moment here, Q. Uh, the, the Q factor is zero. And it's just F, R cross F is the torque. Okay, that's, that's for a pure force. This is where when you apply a force, it matters where you apply that force by this R. So you have to take R cross F. Okay? And then this is, you know, and then interestingly enough, the pure moment is analogous to a translation, which a translation is a screw with a zero pitch, or sorry, an infinite pitch. Well, uh, a, a wrench with an infinite Q value, okay, is a pure moment. And, and again, if this is infinity, if it's a pure moment, then uh, there's zero force. It's just a pure moment. And again, the locationness of it goes away. It's irrelevant. It times it by zero, zero. It's all the same thing I lecture on. This is why moments don't have a location. And then again, infinity times zero can be some finite number. It's a, it's a pure torque. And then the screw with some finite pitch is the same thing as, as the wrench with a Q. Okay? But here's the interesting thing that you might, as you go through... Uh, this lecture and redo the whole thing but in the context of forces and torques instead of rotations, uh, re angular velocities I mean, and uh, linear velocities um, and, and pitches and Q values and stuff. As you go through and do this, the full lecture and rethink of everything in the context of loads, um, you'll get confused by one thing which is you'll notice the top vector here is the angular component for velocity. It's, it's angular velocity. But the top vector here is a linear component. So you can see the pure moments are the angular component of the load, but angular velocity is the angular component of velocity. And this is on the top and this is on the bottom. And the linear components, this one's on the bottom and this one's on the top. So nature organizes this in a very bizarre way, but thank goodness it does. You'll see there's a huge consequence to how this is organized. But the analogy holds over the entire lecture. But the one little thing that's tweaked is, like I said, linear on top here, angular on bottom, angular on top here, linear on bottom. Um, and uh, you'll see the mystery of what comes of that. OK, so with that, um, hopefully you understood it. Uh, thank you for watching. And uh, uh, get all ready for lecture three, and then after that, it's all downhill and a lot of fun from there. So stick with the course.